Hi, my name is Carla Sinopoli, and I'm the director of the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology here on the University of New Mexico campus. Welcome. The Maxwell Museum explores human stories past and present and works towards greater understandings of the fullness of human experiences in the Southwest and the world. Today, we're going to go far beyond the Southwest as we explore the first few million years of the human story with the tour of our ancestors exhibition. We'll also go behind the scenes of the museum to visit our collections and the laboratories of University of New Mexico anthropologists who study human origins. The human story is interwoven with the story of every other living thing on Earth. Our earliest ancestors from millions of years ago had ancestors millions of years old, who had ancestors millions of years old, and so on. They certainly didn't look like we do today. But then again, neither did the Earth. Humans, as we know them today, look and behave as we do because each generation inherited beneficial traits from earlier generations, allowing them to adapt and survive in a changing environment. As we walk through the exhibition, we'll take a close look at these traits. Bipedalism, reduced dentition, tool use, large thinking brains, language, culture, and art. And we'll examine how they have changed over time. You may ask, how are we able to examine traits that existed in our ancestors millions of years ago? Well, we look to the fossil and archeological records for answers. In 1959, paleoanthropologists Lewis and Mary Leakey wanted to understand our human origins. They wondered where they would find evidence of early humans. They hypothesized that remains of our earliest ancestors would likely be found where our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, live. So they looked to Africa to test their hypotheses. And sure enough, they found what they were looking for in the Great Rift Valley of East Africa stone tools millions of years old, and fossil remains of early human-like beings. Their discovery launched a lot of additional research, which continues today, and confirms that the origin of the human family, the hominins, is in East Africa. Fossils of our far distant relatives, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, and Homo habilis, have only been found in Africa and date to 4.4 million years ago for Ardipithecus, 3.5 million years for Australopithecus, and 2.6 million years for Homo habilis. Around 1.8 million years ago, another group of early hominins, Homo erectus, left the African continent. Their fossils have been found as far away as East Asia. An even later group, Homo neanderthalensis, evolved in the Middle East and Europe around 300,000 years ago. And finally, our species, Homo sapiens, evolved from earlier forms in Africa around 200,000 years ago. Some groups left Africa around 100,000 years ago, and now humans live on every continent on Earth. Paleoanthropologists are scientists who study the origin and development of early humans. Fossil evidence and material cultural remains, such as stone tools, can provide information about the physical form, behaviors, and past environments of our early ancestors. For example, the cast model in this display is of the remains of a Neanderthal who lived around 60,000 years ago and was likely deliberately buried by members of his community after his death. The remains, along with lots of other evidence of the lives of Neanderthals, were found by an international team of archaeologists at the site of Kabara Cave in Israel in 1983. Analysis of the remains tell us that this was a male individual in his mid-twenties. He had no cavities in his teeth. Butchered animal bones and charred plant remains recovered at the cave reveal that his diet consisted of gazelle, other animals, wild wheat, legumes, and nuts. He suffered a wound to his left arm and if you look closely, you may see a broken and healed bone. See if you can also identify the jaw, pelvis, spine, and ribs. Mm -hmm. 
Finally, stone tools were found near his body, indicating the technologies and cultural traditions he and his group practiced. In addition to fossilized bone, teeth, and stone tools, scientists used DNA evidence to understand our biological past. This molecule can reveal patterns of inheritance that allow us to trace our origins back to a common ancestor. The last common ancestor of both humans and our closest living relative, the chimpanzee, lived approximately 7.5 million years ago. Since then, the changes in the inherited traits from one generation to the next of the separate populations that descended from this common ancestor have resulted in new species, those related to humans and those related to chimps. It's theorized that this common ancestor was very chimp-like, so it's useful to compare traits among chimps and humans to understand our common ancestor better. Let's go to the lab and meet Professor Sherry Nelson to take a closer look at those traits. Hi, I'm Sherry Nelson. I am a paleoanthropologist here at the University of New Mexico. So I study fossil apes and fossil humans. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in that first transition from ape to early human. So I study fossils, but I also study modern chimps in their habitats so that I can reconstruct these early ancestors. Uh, chimps are great because they're our sister taxa, they're our closest relatives, but also they look a lot like some of our early ancestors in many ways. And a question is with these early ancestors, all right, they look chimpy, but how are they different? And one of the first things to happen in human evolution is we start walking on two feet instead of four. Now that's a pretty tricky transition. And as any of you know who've tried to skateboard or roller skate or ski, it's hard to stay on balance when you're on two legs instead of four. Your feet want to fall out in front of you. And the trick is we're trying to keep balanced over our center of gravity. Now we're not the only bipeds on Earth. If you think about it, there's a big group of animals that can walk on two legs. I'll give you a hint. We're talking birds. And if you've watched pigeons in the park, how do they do it? They bob back and forth. You can thank your early ancestors that we do not bob like pigeons. We have a whole suite of skeletal features designed to be bipedal, to walk on two legs. And we're going to look at those from our head all the way to our toe. And the best way to look at it is to compare a chimp to a human. So let's start with our chimp over here. Now chimps are in rainforest. They walk on the ground on four legs instead of two, so quadrupeds. But they're also in the trees a lot. And so they are designed to be in the trees with really long arms and short legs. And when I talk about center of gravity in a chimp, you know, it's right there in the middle of the body. So you've got this body spread all around that center of gravity with four legs. It's easy to stay balanced. Let's try to make that chimp stand up, though. Chimps can walk bipedally. They can stand bipedally. They're just not very good at it. And the first problem as our chimp stands up is that center of gravity, you know, stand up, is sitting in front. It's in the chest. They're, they're top heavy. They have these long arms and short legs. And so that's going to want to make them tip over. Now when you turn to the human, you know, we're bottom heavy. You need nice long legs for a nice long bipedal stride, and you don't need the really long arms anymore to be in the trees. So our center of gravity is going to lie right there in our pelvis. That's what we're going to have to wrap ourselves around. So I said head to toe. Let's start with the head. And we're going to start with where this spine enters the head for this chimp. So pretend you're a quadruped. If you need to look forward, you're going to have to lift your head up. And that means your neck muscles are firing for a long time. It's going to hurt. Chimp doesn't have to do that because its spine is entering towards the back of its skull. So now we're a chimp, and now I gotta make my chimp stand up. I do that, and I'm looking at the sky. So we need to fix that to be on two legs. You look at our human, the spine is entering under the skull 
instead of behind the skull. And that is such a diagnostic feature that when we turn to the early fossil record, you know, fossil records are scrappy. You're not going to find a whole skeleton in the fossil record. And the earliest hominids we have are mostly known from skull parts. But if we can find that hole on the skull, then we can say if it's walking like a chimp or walking like a human. So, here's our earliest hominid. This is Sahelanthropus. It's about six or seven million years old from Chad, the middle of Africa. And if you look, the foramen magnum is under the skull, not behind it. So right from the start, our early ancestors are on two legs instead of four. And it's not just that one. Another early hominid is Artipithecus. It's four-ish, five-ish million years old, under the skull. And next we have Australopithecines, under the skull. All of these guys, judging from the skull, are walking on two legs instead of four. So that's the top of your spine. Let's keep going for the rest of the spine. And this is where humans and chimps are going to differ a lot again. Because in a chimp, when they're in the trees, they're usually suspensory. They're hanging beneath the branches. You know, monkeys can walk on top of branches because they're small. But these guys are pretty big and they could break branches. So they need to hang under. Now picture yourself hanging under a tree. And if you've got this long body, it could be swinging under this tree and you could hurt yourself. Chimps need to shorten it. They need to have a nice compact torso so that they're not swinging all around. And you can do that in your lower spine. So on the chimp, that little area between the rib cage and the pelvis is pretty short. That's great for hanging beneath the trees. But like I said, we gotta stand our chimp up. And now, with this nice, short, compact body, when a chimp walks bipedally, the whole body kinda has to swing back and forth. Humans are doing it differently. So, with our spine, we have lengthened your lower back. There is more room between your rib cage and your hip. Number one, that's going to allow us to rotate a little more when we walk so that we're not swinging back and forth like a chimp. But number two, remember our center of gravity. I said you have to balance around it. And I told you birds do it by bobbing back and forth. We don't have to bob back and forth because our spine has become S-shaped. It's curved. That curvature puts some of your weight behind your center of gravity, some of it in front of your center of gravity, and it keeps you balanced. So that's starting at your head and moving to your spine. Next, we need to look at the hips. And for that, again, we'll turn to a chimp and human pelvis. OK, so what we have here are a chimp pelvis and a human pelvis. And what I want you to look at are the blades. These blades right here and how they're oriented. So in a chimp, these blades are flat right across the body. But in a human, we started wrapping those blades around to the side of our body. And that's important because there are small muscles that attach to the back of these blades. And how they well, how they make our legs move depends on how they're attached. So if we start with our chimp pelvis and our muscles are on the back, when they fire, they're going to pull your leg back. In a human, now they're on the side of your body. And when they fire, they're going to pull your leg sideways. We need that to control for what we call pelvic tilt. So we already said it's a challenge to walk on two legs and stay balanced instead of four. But if you think about it, when you walk, one leg is swinging in front of you. And that means that you're actually balancing on one foot, not two. And for that side of your body where your leg is swinging in front of you, there's nothing supporting it. And gravity wants to pull it down. We need to pull it back up. 
And that's why we need muscles on the side to pull our leg back up and keep us from falling sideways. Chimpanzees don't have that. They can't control for that pelvic tilt. So again, they can walk and stand bipedally. They're just not as good at it as we are. And that's one of the reasons why. So head to toe, next up, let's take a look at the top of your leg. And that takes us to the femur. So here we go, this is your leg here. And if you think about it, when you're standing or walking on two legs instead of four, all of your weight is on just those two legs. A chimps is spread out over all four. That's a lot of weight on these joints. And so humans have bigger leg joints than chimps do. And you can see that with the top of the femur here, this human neck area and head area is bigger than in the chimps. You can see it if you move down to your knees. So this is the bone, your tibia, that lies under the femur. And in a chimp versus a human, we've got thicker bone up here than in the chimp. And then the other part of the femur is, again, we're still balancing around our center of gravity, which is right here in our pelvis. In a chimp, the femur runs straight up and down so that the legs are sort of right there on the side of the pelvis. But in humans, we've tucked our knee under the center of gravity, under the pelvis, and that's how we stay balanced. And so, with our leg, there is an angle tucking those knees in. We're not kneed compared to the chimp. Now, when you look to the fossil record, you rarely find an entire skeleton, right? But if you find scraps of those bones, like that femur, it can be enough to tell you if this australopithecine was bipedal or quadrupedal. So we have a bit of a top femur, and we can see a nice big chunky joint there. We have part of the bottom of the femur, and when you stand it on the table, you can see this big angle, right? They are tucking their knees under their center of gravity. This belongs to a bipedal hominid, not quadruped like a chimp. And so next, we've moved through our leg. The last thing we need to look at is your ankle and your foot. So I've got a human foot and I have a chimp foot. And the first thing you might note when you look at this chimp foot is that it looks a whole lot like a hand, right? That big toe is jutting out just like your thumb does. And that's important because, again, chimps are in the trees a lot. And they want to be able to grasp those branches with not just their hands, but also their feet. So they have this toe that sticks out. Now with humans, picture when you walk, we've already put our leg in swing phase, and then it's going to hit the ground, and your heel hits it, and you roll your foot, and then you push off with your toe. And so we need a robust big toe and we need it to be in line with the rest of the toes, not jutting out, and that's gonna help us with our foot movement. Now I said the first thing to hit is the heel. That's a lot of force going through your foot. So humans have this really big chunky heel bone compared to the skinnier one on a chimp. And then the last thing is our ankle. So, we don't want to roll our ankle around too much. Any of you that have twisted an ankle before know it hurts. What you want to do is have a nice big chunky ankle for a nice stable ankle. Chimps have a smaller ankle bone. They need a mobile ankle. If you picture climbing up a tree, chimps can bend their foot to almost touch their leg as they move up a tree. Now, we don't have many feet bones in the fossil record, but I've got one for you. This belongs to a Homo habilis, so not too far off from the Australopithecines. And when we look at it, its big toe is in line with the rest. It's a good biped. Now the ankle is still kind of small, so it was probably a little more flexible than us. And that 
is head to toe. Now I told you most of the fossil record are just scraps, but we have one fantastic skeleton for our early ancestors, an Australopithecine, whom you may know as Lucy. So let's go meet Lucy. Okay, this is Lucy. She's an Australopithecine. She's about three million years old. You can see she's tiny. She's only about three feet tall. And she is the best fossil we have for a skeleton for an early ancestor. Now, we walk through all of these bipedal features and we can see some of those in Lucy. For example, with her pelvis, I said our blades start to wrap around the sides of our body instead of being flat. Now hers aren't as wrapped as around as much as ours are, but they're getting there so that her muscles would have sat on the side and they would have helped her with that pelvic tilt we talked about when you're swinging your leg forward. We have her leg bone, her top one, her femur. It's got this nice long neck like ours and it's broken, but you can hopefully see that there's an angle there. So she would have tucked her knees under her pelvis. The knee joint is a pretty big one. So again, walking on two legs instead of four. Now the funny thing is, when we look at other parts of her skeleton, they look a little more chimpy, like she was still in the trees. So we talked about how chimps have really long arms for being suspensory in the trees. And we have really long legs. Well, Lucy's kind of in between. She's got sort of longer arms relative to legs than we do. And another key feature for being in the trees is your shoulder blade, your scapula. So here's our shoulder blade. Sits right there on your back, swimming around in a bunch of muscle. And right there is where your arm bone your humerus comes into contact with it. Well, in a human, our scapula sits like that, and that process where the humerus attaches sort of goes straight out. But this is a chimp scapula, and when I put them next to each other, you can see that ours is facing towards the side. The chimp's is facing up towards the head. Remember, apes are suspensory, and that means their arms are often above their heads. And that's why their scapula is shaped differently. Now, I don't have a whole shoulder blade for Lucy, but we have that little bit where the humerus attaches. And if I put it next to that chimp, it's facing towards her head, not towards the side of her body like us. So, she was bipedal but she was also in the trees. Now these early hominids need to walk on two legs instead of four because they've left the rainforest. They've got to travel further each day to find food and safe places. Bipedalism is really efficient. It's better than walking on four legs like a chimp. But they still needed to be in the trees too because that's where some of the food is, like fruit. And they're out there in these habitats with lots of predators. They don't have fire yet. They don't have spears and things like that yet. They need to be able to climb in the trees for safety. So at this stage with our early hominids, they're compromised, they're doing both. They're walking on two legs on the ground, but they're still climbing in the trees. So that then begs the question, all right, where is it in human evolution that we become just like us? We're big and tall and only on the ground, not in the trees anymore. And that happens with Homo erectus. It's about 1.8 million years old. And it just so happens that we have a really good skeleton for Homo erectus called Turconoboy. And that's who I'm, we're going to meet next. So this is Turconoboy, a young Homo erectus. Now, looking at his teeth, we've been able to figure out that he was only about eight years old when he died, but he was already bigger than me. He was five foot four. And we talked about how bipeds have nice long legs for a long stride. He has that, right? He's five foot four. He has a pelvis that looks like ours. He's got really robust femoral head like ours. Robust knees like ours. All the features of bipedalism we talked about. 
and he's lost all those arboreal features that we saw in Lucy. So for example, we have his shoulder blade and it looks human. It's pointing sideways, not up towards the head. So at this point, we look like us in terms of our skeleton, our body posture, and our walking. Now once we became bipedal, you know, there are advantages to it. For example, it frees up your hands to do other things, such as making tools out of rocks. And to do that, we're going to need to redesign our hands a little bit. So we're going to look at that in a few minutes. But first, I'm going to turn it back to Carla because she has some early hominid footprints to show you. Skeletal anatomy isn't the only clue that tells us of early human bipedalism. Paleoanthropologist Mary Leakey made another discovery in Old Divide Gorge, which is part of the Great Rift Valley in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. Her discovery provided a snapshot in time of early human locomotion, fossilized footprints. This Old Divide trackway, as it's called, was made by a group of Australopithecines who walked across muddy soil approximately 3.5 million years ago. The footprints of these individuals were later filled in by volcanic ash. Over time, the soils hardened, and then millions of years later, eroded away to reveal the ancient footprints. Examining the footprints shows the foot anatomy and pattern of walking just like humans have today, striking first with our heels, rolling through the arch, and then pushing off with the big toe. Here we see a famous Australopithecine, Australopithecus afarensis, found in the Afar Triangle of Ethiopia in the Great Rift Valley in East Africa by paleoanthropologist Donald Johansson and his team in 1974. They named her Lucy after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The fossilized skeleton of this nearly complete specimen revealed that bipedalism was a human trait that evolved early on before any of our other distinguishing traits appeared. Leaving their arboreal or tree-dwelling existence behind and spending their waking hours mainly terrestrially or on the ground gave our earliest ancestors a whole new menu of options for eating. This is reflected in changes in their dentition, the kind, number, and arrangement of their teeth. Let's check that out with Alex in the lab. Thanks, Carla. My name is Alex Denning, and I'm the Senior Collections Manager of Human Osteology at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. Comparing modern human and chimpanzee dentition, we see that the kind, number, and arrangement of teeth are the same. The size and shape of the teeth and jaw, however, are quite different. Humans and chimpanzees are both omnivores, meaning they eat both plants and animals. So why the big difference in tooth and jaw size and shape? The answer lies in the behaviors of our historical relatives and the diversity of the foods available in their local environment. Here we see a timeline of the changes in the teeth, jaws, and skulls of our early ancestors with the chimpanzee here on the left comparable to our last common ancestor. Early on with the Australopithecines, we see large teeth and heavy jaws connected to powerful chewing muscles. The skulls are built to attach and manipulate these large muscles. The lower jaw, the mandible, is rectangular in shape with the cheek teeth along the side in parallel rows. They ate coarse, gritty food that wore their large teeth down slowly. Their jaws and teeth protruded out further than their eyes and nose, and they had a relatively small brain case. As time went on and hominins consumed new and different kinds of plants and animals, dentition changed. And about 2.5 million years ago, something monumental occurred. Starting with the early Homo, we see an archaeological record come to be with the appearance of stone tools. The use of modified stone as a tool to crack open bone led to the consumption of highly nutritious bone marrow. Later on, about one to two million years ago, Homo erectus started using fire to process meat before eating. From then on, using tools and fire to process food made large, robust teeth and jaws unnecessary, and we see changes in the mandible and skull of Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalensis. The mandible starts to round out, becoming oval in shape. The teeth, jaws, and muscle attachments reduce in size. Over many generations, the length of the jaw shortens, and the teeth are positioned more underneath the eyes and nose, and the brain case enlarges. Finally, in more recent times, we see the mandible among Homo sapiens is very small, round, and lightweight. The chewing muscles are proportionally smaller as well. 
The teeth and jaws are positioned directly under the eyes and nose, and the brain case is largest of all. Back to you, Carla. Since cultural changes had such a big influence on the physical and behavioral traits of humans, let's take a closer look at tool use. Humans aren't the only animals to make and use tools. Chimpanzees modify branches and leaves to use as a tool for getting food and water. But humans have taken this trait to an entirely new level. We currently have tools in transit to Mars to work remotely on an entirely different planet. Our physical, behavioral, and intellectual adaptations have given us a whole new edge, so to speak. We'll look at early tools in more detail soon. First, though, let's return to Sherry's lab to learn more about the physical traits of these early tool makers. Welcome back to the lab. So Carla was just telling you that chimpanzees modify things in their habitat to make simple tools. You know, sticks to termite fish or ant fish. But the earliest hominids take things to a whole new level. And so just like with bipedalism, we took the chimpanzee skeleton and redesigned it to be bipeds. We need to redesign our hand. So this is a chimp hand. I'm missing a bit of a finger here. <laughs> and this is a human hand. Chimpanzees use their hands, remember that grasping, suspensory behavior. They need their hands to behave like a hook. And so they have long fingers, but also really long palms. So if I hold this up to my hand, you can see these bones are your palm. These bones are your fingers. Now compare that chimp and human. A lot longer in that chimp, makes a nice long hook. But that's a little problematic if you want a really dexterous hand, if you want to be able to manipulate your grip. So big long fingers, palm, little thumb. Ours is shortened. Shortened palm, shortened fingers. Our thumb has gotten more robust. And our fingertips, for example, the thumbs here are more robust. That's going to give us all that tactile sensation and dexterity. So if you think about your grip and the way you use your grip, you've got a power grip. Picture trying to take this lid off this jar. You have a precision grip, trying to hold your pencil or some chopsticks. And that's also going to play a role and how you're, look at how important your thumb is when you're trying to skin a hide or something like that. Now you can see in ours, with our shortened proportions, you can take your thumb and touch every single fingertip really easily. Try doing that when your hand's that long. So we have modified our hand to give us the ability to have the manual dexterity to make stone tools. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to another professor here at UNM, Ian Wallace, and he's going to tell you all about these early stone tool industries. I'm Ian Wallace, a professor of anthropology here at UNM, and I'm a researcher of human evolution. Archaeologists identify periods of tool making based on the forms of the tools and the techniques used to form them, techniques that tool makers learned from their elders and passed on to the next generation. While early hominins likely made tools out of perishable materials, the first stone tools that appear in the archaeological record were known as the Oldowan industry, named after Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. These tools date to about two and a half to one and a half million years ago, and this is the time of Homo habilis and the last of the Australopithecines. Oldowan tools were simple cobble chopping tools formed by knocking a flake off of a cobble to create sharp edges. These could be used to get at foods such as hard-shelled fruits, roots, meat, and even bone marrow. Later in time, Homo erectus created more sophisticated tools, which archaeologists call the Acheulean industry, dating from about 1.7 million years ago to 300,000 years ago. These tools were called bifaces, with flaking on both sides, and more deliberately shaped than earlier Oldowan tools including triangular shaped tools known as hand axes with tips that come to a point, and other tools with a broad flat edge called cleavers. They were multi-purpose cutting and chopping tools, useful for chopping wood, cutting meat, and a range of other purposes. 
Homo erectus took this technology with them when they left Africa. So here we can see an Acheulean hand axe from Africa and one from Europe. From 300,000 to 30,000 years ago, we see tools in the archaeological record that are much more sophisticated. The Middle Paleolithic or Middle Stone Age tool industry associated in Europe and Asia with Homo neanderthalensis and in Africa with early Homo sapiens, our species. This tool industry consisted of small bifaces, points, scrapers, and some simple hafted points that could be attached to a wooden pole or a long bone. These tools functioned in scraping, cutting, piercing, and a variety of other purposes. Finally, the last period of the Stone Age is known as the Upper Paleolithic in Europe and the Late Stone Age in Africa, and is characterized by the most complex and sophisticated tools of all, made of stone, bone, wood, and fibers. Associated with Homo sapiens and consisting of blades, flakes, spears and spear throwers, harpoons, fish hooks, and bows and arrows, traps and nets, these elaborate composite tools and weapons were used for various tasks and hunting. These toolkits are diverse from place to place as humans adapted their technologies to different environments and resources. Back to you, Carla. Think about what it takes to make a stone tool. You have to have an idea of modifying something in your environment for a particular future purpose. Then you have to find and imagine in the resource the design you need for your objective. You need knowledge of the natural world and understanding of the properties of the materials available to work with. Then you have to experiment and predict how that material will respond and change as you work it. As early stone tools became more and more complex, the thinking and learning brain did as well. We've seen up to this point the physical and behavioral traits that have led to larger brains. Fossilized skulls, along with stone tools, provide evidence for increased brain size and thinking capacity. Stone tools also show us the dawn of our cultural development, along with other evidence we'll take a look at soon. Large brains allow us to store and process vast amounts of information about our natural and social environments. But having a large brain comes at a cost. Large brains can make birth difficult and they require a lot of energy to develop and function. As a result, human babies are born relatively immature and require long childhoods where they are highly dependent on adults for care. This trait sets the stage for social development, requiring a need to communicate and cooperate to ensure the success and survival of our species. Now let's take a closer look at our social development by examining material, culture, language, and art. In Europe, Neanderthals lived alongside our species, Homo sapiens, for thousands of years. We know from DNA analysis that they interbred with Homo sapiens, so that many people of Asian and European descent have some Neanderthal DNA. Today, Homo sapiens are the only hominins in existence. Our Upper Paleolithic or Late Stone Age ancestors who expanded across the globe lived in small social units, building temporary shelters and moving across the landscape seasonally, searching for plants and animals for food and gathering and transforming other resources to make the goods they needed to survive and thrive. And in so doing, they transformed their physical and social worlds in ways that enabled them to adapt to the many environments in which they lived. Human creativity and problem solving also contributed to much more rapid change and variability. So while the Achillean tools of Homo erectus were largely unchanged for more than a million years wherever Homo erectus were found, with our species we see much more rapid change and variation in technologies, in social relations, in the development of many languages and belief systems, and on and on, laying the foundations for the remarkable cultural diversity and richness we see in the world today. Like us today, our Homo sapiens ancestors also created art, evidence for complex symbolic thinking and cultural behavior. Wherever we find early Homo sapiens, we find evidence for artistic production. Rock art, ornaments, figurines, and decorated tools and objects. 
This cave recreates one type of shelter inhabited by Homo sapiens during the Ice Age in Western Europe and the art it contains. Here we see a recreation of paintings found in Salon Noir, located in the Neo Cave in southern France. This representational art depicts the animals that lived in the region when these paintings were made between 16,000 and 10,000 years ago. It is evidence of not only abstract symbolic thought, but of life in social groups that likely had a spiritual connection to the natural world. The art associated with Upper Paleolithic people of Western Europe also includes portable art in the form of small carvings, decorated harpoon handles, and small clay figurines. Late Stone Age people also adorned their bodies with beads and other ornaments. And in cold climates such as Europe, bone needles and hide scrapers provide evidence for sewn clothing. These objects and features give us a picture of communities with complex social and symbolic lives, communicating with each other through spoken language and with the natural world through spiritual practices. Our story of early human origins ends here, at the end of the Stone Age, when our species is the only surviving one of the many hominin species that came before. By the end of the Stone Age, humans were spread across the world in every continent except Antarctica. As the Ice Ages came to an end, humans creatively responded to the challenges of changing climates in a variety of ways, including in some regions the domestication of plants and animals and the creation of ever more complex ways of organizing themselves and the world around them. In several areas of the world, these changes led societies on a path to more hierarchical forms of organization, including the development of states and cities. But for now, here we end our tour, hoping you have a greater understanding and appreciation of our early human history. Consider how you fit into the story. What are your physical, intellectual, and behavioral traits that make you uniquely human? How do your intellectual and behavioral traits help you face the challenges of living in a changing world? Points to ponder with those large thinking brains of yours.